Nebiji commanded great respect in many areas of thought and writing, poetry, drama, literary criticism for a start. He broke new ground with his own much admired work, Ekanta and others, as well as in his studies of Mukti Bodh and Mohan Rakesh, as indeed he did with the journal on theater that he edited, Natrang. He was also actively involved in Ipta during the 1940s, with which I have a small little family connection. When I was a teenager, I used to also run around with Ipta groups in Bombay. And this for him was an involvement that included an important role also played by his wife, Rekha. I regard him as a colleague in many ways. He taught at the National School of Drama and in the Jawaharlal Nehru University. His translation of D.E. Kosambi's book, The Culture and Civilization of India, indicated his intellectual affiliation with historians. And this was more especially so, so with those for whom history is a way of listening in, as it were, to the dialogue between the past and the present, and observing how the one illuminates the other. My lecture today, therefore, is a tribute to the work and to the memory of Sri Nemi Chandra Jain. I shall be speaking this evening on two interrelated themes. One is the recognition of what we have begun to call the other with a capital O. And the second is the interface of this other with established society and religion, which I shall be calling the self, with a capital S. The interface naturally covers an unending range of activities. I shall take up only a few examples, focusing on connections between religion and society, and the diverse relationships between the self and the other. What we refer to as the other needs explaining. Put simply, it is a person or a group of people who declare themselves to be or are recognized as different. The other or others differ from the self, whomever the self or the selves may be, and the degree of dissimilarity varies. It can be just a passing recognition of difference, or it can be expressed in acceptance or rejection. But however different the other demands recognition in every society, this also helps to define the identity of what is called the self. And like the self, the other too has multiple aspects. So, in a kind of contradictory sort of way, the other can become, to some degree, a part of the self. And this is something I'd like you to keep in mind as I discuss my examples. Those whom we see as essentially different often help us to define ourselves, both individually and socially. Identifying people by otherness, or alterity, as it is sometimes called, can be used to marginalize a section of society, to ghettoize it, even to exile it. Multiple groups all over the world become refugees by denying them citizenship or by banishing them. This is an old historical habit. Alternatively, the other can be incorporated into one's own society, as was also done repeatedly in the past, and created what we often call civilizations. These have been projected as unitary and monolithic, but in fact they were porous and were textured from multiple divergent strands. 
The relationship of the self with the other can change over time and move from being distanced to being proximate or the reverse. The identity of each can also change, but the presence of each is an important component of social relations. Every society marks the self from the other in diverse ways. The recognition of otherness was worked into a theory in the last two centuries. Colonial thinking had sharpened the definition. The concept of race underlay many colonial attitudes towards the colonized. These were colored by the binary in European thought between what they called the civilized and the primitive. The historical context is therefore crucial to understanding the idea of both the self and the other. Who then determines otherness? Those in authority generally see themselves as the established self. They set up the identity of the self vis-a-vis -vis the other. This helps to, to crystallize power and distances those without it. These are not permanent identities, nor are they unchanging. Even the criteria can change. The identity of otherness was not restricted to people that came from different geographies and cultures. It could arise, and sometimes to a startling degree, within the same society. Since societies are stratified, socially and culturally, divergence ranges across multiple aspects. Among them are environment and location, economy and technology, systems of kinship and inheritance, and concepts of belief and worship. In short, the constituents of what we call culture or the pattern of living. Because of these differences, the existence of the other was and is inevitable. But what is historically valuable is to observe how these differences shaped both the self and the other. The relationship was not inherently hostile, although in practice it sometimes could be, or alternatively, it could be mutually acceptable. Where there is competition, there inevitably the stronger treats the weaker, the differentiated one, as the other. <coughs> the presence of the other was noticed some centuries ago, almost wherever the processes of thinking are recorded. It was often conceded in subtle ways. One way was through argument, and it's something we all love to do. A procedure suggesting this was familiar to virtually every philosophical tradition, often linked to the exercise of logic. It hints at something akin to the dialectical method. The view of the opponent is presented and then countered by that of the proposer or the proponent, followed possibly by a solution. And we are familiar with this in Indian philosophy, of course, with the whole concept of Purva Paksha, Prati Paksha, and Siddhanta. The procedure revolves around the views of the self and the other. Knowledge, however, is not fixed, and there is always the possibility of new evidence and fresh methods of inquiry. Therefore, constant questioning was a necessity. The presence of the other, whether in Persian person or in the form of contradictory thought, has to be recognized as normal to both the living and the thinking of any society. A society has to accommodate the other, if need be through argument and discussion, and if no resolution is forthcoming, then agree to a coexistence. Our current impatience with the other looms over us in so many different ways. It is most vocal these days in the connect between religion and society. I would therefore like to take up three examples from our pre-modern history and comment on 
the perception of the other in these. I'm sorry, this is all rather dense, but it will become a little more easy to follow as we go along with the examples. But before I do that, before I get to my examples, let me clarify briefly how some of us as historians analyze the interface between religion and society. This is important since neither the kinds of societies in which we live nor the kinds of religions we practice are accidental inventions. They are consciously thought out choices and we have to understand them as such. I, for one, see religion as expressed in two forms, what I call informal and formal. Informal religion is the religion of the individual whose choice of whom to worship and why is a free and personal decision. More often, however, the decision is made for us through the link between religion and social identity, especially amongst the elite. Formal religion, on the other hand, is when a belief in practice accumulates followers who identify with it and it imposes codes of belief and social practices specific to that identity. It establishes institutions in society that give it authority and increase its supporters. The more obvious institutions train priests and monks, administer regular places of worship, organize donations, search for a guaranteed patronage, maintain formal rituals and texts, and encourage the crystallization of orthodoxy. So formal religion has its work cut out. This latter becomes the font of religion and is acknowledged by society. New religions often begin informally with increasing social support, they take on a formal aspect, and establish institutions to propagate their ideas. Their visibility, the formal religions, their visibility takes the form of structures, physical structures, viharas, temples, mosques, churches, ashrams, mats, matasas, convents, khankas, gurdwaras, and so on. When this happens, it is a sign that the function of that religion is not limited to personalized belief and informal worship, but that it is now in the public domain as a powerful agency involved in social and political policies. At this point, the interface between religion and society registers immense complexity. Socially and politically powerful religions root their codes in a claim to orthodoxy. This is when the other takes form as a social entity, either simply or as more than one. The other dissents from the orthodoxy and has its own form of belief and organization evolving from the dissent. Orthodoxy has a choice. Dissent can be excluded as contrary or placed in juxtaposition to other sects or even at some later date assimilated. <coughs> Historical change, however, can alter these relationships. Religions, as practiced in India, tended not to be monolithic or uniform across the entire region. In pre-colonial times, social concerns of a religious nature and religious identities were expressed more frequently through sects. These spoke to the larger number of people and less to the limited elite. It is great, crucial, therefore, to locate the sections of society to which a particular sect may be speaking. Cultures, we must remember, never remain homogenous and unchanging. There is no pristine, unalloyed culture that continues as such throughout, its, uh, throughout history. Every culture mutates or molds either through its own historical evolution or in proximity to new elements. 
that it has multiple roots and multiple branching off ensures its immortality. So much for the dense part. Now I will come to the examples. I would like to begin by discussing, discussing an example of the other going back to the second millennium BC to Vedic times. The dominant religion was that, of course, of the Vedas, as practiced and taught by Brahmins and thought to be unique to them. The texts, however, refer to the presence of others as well. But this presence is seldom conceded by us, and the story from the side of the other remains largely uninvestigated. The Rig Veda refers frequently to two distinct categories of people, the Arya Varna and the Dasa Varna. The Arya, from which Max Müller invented the word Arya, were those that were respected as persons of status who spoke Sanskrit correctly, and who followed the Vedic religion. Language was the key to identity, and this incorporated status. The identification of Aryan became axiomatic in the 19th century, when race was a primary factor in the colonial understanding of the people it had colonized. The idea of an Aryan race arose from confusing the cultural idiom of language, the Aryan speech, with the altogether different factor of biological birth. We know about the culture of the Arya from detailed descriptions in the texts of the Vedic corpus. But who then was the Dasa, also frequently referred to as the Dasa Varan? Evidently, the other of the Arya, since the term is often used in that sense. Whatever the Arya does, the Dasa does it differently. Those who cannot, not unexpectedly, the first distinction is that of language. Those that cannot speak the Vedic language correctly, or not at all, are dismissed as Vridravacha, of hostile or incorrect speech. And in later texts, those who speak incorrectly are called the lecture. Much fun is made of those who invariably replace the R sound by the L sound, which is why you end up by getting in the inscriptions of Ashoka references to Laja Magade rather than Raja Magade. These Blitch were the inhabitants of the Ganges plain because this sound replacement occurs in this region for many centuries. If everyone was in origin an Aryan speaker, such mistakes would have been unlikely. Language is an immediate identity. What were the other unambiguous differences? Since the Dasas practice a different religion, they are called a labor without gods. They do not perform the required ritual sacrifices, the yagyas, not even the soma ritual. And so it is said that they are lacking in rituals. Worse still, they are disapproved of for being phallic worshippers. They indulge in magic, as did the Atudhana and the Rakshas, and so are, they are disliked and possibly even a little envied. They are generally unfriendly, greedy, and socially rather unacceptable. But there are complications. Some are also very wealthy, especially in herds of cattle, and therefore are subjected to cattle raids. And cattle hustling is a very known activity in the Vedic texts and later as well. The Dasas live in settlements with stockades, and these the Aryas attack with the help of the gods Indra and Agni. The Dasas are divided into clans, Vish, each headed by a chief. And a few chiefs are even said to be the patrons of the Vedic ritual sacrifice. The fees, after all, from wealthy patrons are always appreciated. <laughs> 
this relationship between the Arya and the Dasa that is so intriguing has its own history. It begins with the Dasas as initially an alien category, but gradually one can infer social divisions within the Dasa society, and these differ in their relationship with the Aryas. Not all Dasas are wealthy. Those that were appear to have been inducted into Arya society, whereas the impoverished ones remained in servile occupations. As usual, the women are the more impoverished. Darcy women are treated as chattel and gifted by the wealthy to their friends. The Darcy remains a commodity in the community. Many work as servants in the home of Arya households. This would also be true of the majority of the Dasas who would remain the other, reduced to servitude and distanced socially. But curiously, and this is a big enigma as far as many of us are concerned, curiously, some of the sons of these Dasis are given Brahman status and are referred to literally as Dasi Putra Brahmins. <laughs> what are we told about these Brahmins? Those that are respected are mentioned by name. The Rishi Birgatamas, consistently known by his metronymic, Mahamadeya, suggesting perhaps a different kingship system from the usual patriarchy. He was clearly special because he anointed the great Raja Bharat. He married a Dasi, Ushinja, and their son was the revered Rishi Kakshiva, whose hymns are included in the Rig Ved, who also took his mother's name, Aushinja. Was a Dasi mother just a matter of low status or a mark of being from a different culture? The equally renowned sage, Kavash Ayrusha, was also the son of a Dasi. It is said of him that he was driven away from the Soma sacrifice by the regular Brahmins because he was a Dasi Putra. As he wandered away, he recited some verses and the river Saraswati began to follow him. So the regular Brahman, seeing this, immediately recognized that he was special to the gods. So they welcomed him back gave him Brahman status and more, they declared him to be the best among Brahmins. What was his special power that despite being a Dasi Putra, he was honored by the Brahmins? The Upanishads carry the story of Satyakama Jabala, who, became, who came to the Rishi Gautama requesting that he be accepted as a Vedic student. The Rishi asked him if he was a Brahmin, and Satyakama replied that his mother worked as a Dasi in a household where many men came and went, and she did not recall who his father might have been. The Rishi replies that who but a Brahmin would have told the truth, as Satyakama did, and he was accepted as a student. The issue here is not the Varna identity, but the ethical qualification. Despite having Dasi mothers, these rishis knew the language of the Aryas to perfection, since some of the Rig Vedic hymns are attributed to them. They were not described as Ridravacha or Mlecha, nor was it said of him as it was said <coughs> of the great ancestral figure of the Guru lineage, that they came out of an Asura Rakshas origin. Those Dasi Putras that acquired Brahman status were born to the lowest status mothers, but were recruited into the highest caste. Is there a hint here of a subtle and a new socio-religious interface of a more complex kind that needs further investigation than we have made so far. One sees here the gradual merging of some aspects of both groups modifying their identities. The Dasa has learned the language of the Arya. 
does this amount to his, his having been alienized? On demonstrating his superior power, his superiority is acknowledged and appropriated. Did some of the Dasa culture marginally rub off on the Arya? Or was there a more nuanced mutation in both? These sons of Dasis are not described as Nastika, non-believers, since there seems to be some eagerness to acquire their knowledge. Did this duality expressed in the conversation between the Dasi Buddha Brahman and the high status <coughs> Arya create an elite culture that drew from both sources? The antecedents of these cultures remain intriguing and puzzling questions to their ideological differences as well. The grammarian Patanjali, interestingly, compares the antagonism between the two, between the Sharana and the Brahmana, um, to that between the snake and the mongoose. That gives one an, an idea of what the antagonism, the, the degree of antagonism. The Bharat Emperor Ashoka, for example, makes repeated pleas for harmony between the various sects. But the point is that there were by now a variety of sects with dissenting views, and no religion was a monolithic unity. In the period from the Mauryas to the Guptas, there is a striking presence of impressive Buddhist stupas and an equally striking absence of temples, a situation that was slowly reversed in the subsequent period. It was a time between the Mauryas and the Guptas, it was a time of intense social change with clan societies giving way to caste societies. It was subsequent to this that the Buddhists and Jains, projected as dissidents in the early Purans, experienced persecution. Jainism survived, consolidating itself in particular areas. Buddhism did not eventually, but was predominant in many parts of Asia. Interestingly, every religion in India by now had acquired multiple sects, <laughs> seeking their own patronage and recognition. No formal religion was monolithic. The feasibility of differences and their coexistence was rec recognized, although some among them faced animosity and conflict. But in either case, the relationship of sects, whether friendly or hostile, was confined to smaller and more localized groups than the kinds of groups that we deal with in the world of today. The Shamanas established a new personality on the social landscape, namely that of the renouncer in the form of the monk, the bhikkhu, or the bhikshu. This entity took on the characteristics of what may be called a counterculture, at least initially. It was a new kind of other. The renouncer was distinct from the ascetic. The ascetic went into isolation, searching for ways to liberate his soul from rebirth. The renouncer joined a monastic order, a community that lived as distinct from society, observing its own rituals and identified by formal religion. It broke the rules of caste in being celibate, in taking cooked food from anyone as arms, and in theory at least, there was no segregation of the avarna, rules outside caste, from the others. The monks had some concern with the welfare of society, so they remained partially connected. Unlike the ashrams, the forest hermitages of earlier times, these monasteries were extremely well-organized institutions, and their intervention in social life made an impact. Receiving donations of wealth and large grants of land created what Max Weber has called monastic landlordism. 
not only in India, but also in, in Europe. Their effective interventions in society led to other religious sects establishing counterpart institutions in time, about five to six hundred years later. These other institutions were the Brahman Mats and the Sufi Kharikas and Baradas. A range of religious sects adopted this institutional form as they do to this day. Some were devoted to scholarship, many others were involved in politics and social concerns, expanding their degree of otherness. The Sharanas eventually created their own orthodoxies, but initially they demonstrated the potential of the other. The individual renouncer moved across the historical landscape in diverse forms, some of which we are familiar with today, such as the sadhu, the fakir, the jogi, and so on. In a somewhat contradictory way, the renouncer, opting out of society, acquired moral authority within society. This is a curious kind of puzzle, which is difficult to solve. One wonders whether this was the reason why Cautilia discourages the state from allowing renouncers to enter newly settled lands. Where the state has a tight control over society, as was advocated in the Arthashastra, it exercised the power to disallow dissenting views. This goes back a long way. Renouncers voluntarily chose to join the alternative society that gave them a different identity. But a major category of otherness that we have frequently ignored is, of course, that of an imposed otherness. There's not only one, but there are quite many. I'm referring to the category of the avarna, the lowest castes and those outside caste and untouchable. This was the creation of the upper caste. Of the, uh, this was the creation of the upper castes to ensure bondage and a permanent supply of labor, among other things. The imposition was so oppressive that it disallowed opposition and ensured an unchanging continuity. This is yet one more process of creating the other, and we have to ask. Who is creating it, and for what purpose, and who is being labelled uh, as the, the other? Those that have otherness imposed on them have to question the legitimacy of the imposition. My third example, I'm very sorry, is a rather complicated one. Bear with me. I shall now speak about the other in the context of the many others and the many selves. So far we've been speaking of one other and one self and a few others and so on. Now there's a galaxy of others and a galaxy of selves. I begin jumping another millennium and referring to the 15th, 16th centuries, a remarkable period of the Indian past, especially from the perspective of the history of religion the 15th, 16th centuries AD, of course. There was by now an even greater social mixture than ever before. This is reflected in the teachings, the poems, and the life of the times. The Emperor Akbar was not a flash in the pan, creating new religious trends. I shall be speaking of those less exalted, but whose activities as the other went much further. My example is one facet of the Bhakti movement that arose in every part of the subcontinent under diverse sons. Initially, these were the other in the context of existing religions. Together with these were the Sufi schools that came from Central Asia and settled in India, forming yet more um, institutions of this kind, yet more others 
uh, crucial to the sense. Given the interface of cultures, a spectacular efflorescence of religion and religious teaching followed, affecting many levels of society. This shaped the practice and the belief of those whom we have now brought together under the single label of the Hindu. It also shaped the belief of some of those who were at that time called Yavanas, Shakas, Turushkas, and for whom we today use the single uniform label of Muslims. I shall try and speak of them as they were spoken of in their own time. Neither the Bhakti sons nor the Sufi peeves were founding new religions. They were trying to liberate religion from orthodoxies and jaded conventions, enforced by those who had authority over formal religion. Significantly, the teaching of these many others was open to any person or any group from any religious background. The nature of their otherness varied according to whom they were addressing as the self. The previous religious identities of their followers were therefore irrelevant, nor did they endorse caste conventions. The deity worshipped could be an abstract idea or an icon. The teaching was informal, as were the very scant rituals. Among the earlier saints were Kabir, Ravidas, and Dadu. And those of the lower castes among them, like Ravidas, were searching for their utopias. Ravidas had a vision of a future city where there was to be no social inequality and therefore no sorrow, sorrow what he called Behram Pura. They saw themselves not as a single other, but as diverse, although connected in some way. And this deeply enriched the thought of the times. And then came the great cloudburst that completely immersed so many. This was the immense popularity of Krishna Bhakti, projected through devotion to Krishna and the worship of Krishna and Radha. As one of the idioms of the 16th century, it does need further analysis in terms of how did it come about at this particular time and what did it touch in terms of social levels. A new impulse came with Krishna Bhakti, becoming the focus of another set of Bhakti poets speaking from distant places and distant cultures. These were Chaitanya, Suldas, Bira, Dalde, and many others. But what is interesting to me in all of this is that equally important was the fact that together with these, all these whom we are very familiar with, were their fellow worshippers and poets emerging from a variety of religious and social backgrounds. Among them were the very well-known Ras Khan from a wealthy Zamindar family, <coughs> Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan, who held high offices in the Mughal administration, and disciplines from various religions clustered around the sons. Sheikh Nuruddin, or Nang Rishi as he was called, was a vocal disciple of Lalday. Haridas was the name taken by an important Yavana disciple of Chaitanya. And Sufi poets such as Mullah Shah, Malik Muhammad Jayasi, and Sayyid Mubarak Ali bin Rami, to mention just a few, wrote exquisite poems of adoration to express their Krishna Bhakti. Fortunately, these poems are still sung as part of classical music and dance and on other occasions. Inevitably, it was said by many ordinary people at that time that these Yavanas were attaining moksha through bhakti. <laughs> what I'm saying is nothing new. It is all well known. 
but it sedimenters our discussion to illustrate some forms of bhakti as the other. The question that has not been answered adequately is why was there such an upsurge of Krishna Bhakti at this particular time, drawing in such a variety of people from a range of religious traditions? What were the floating ideas and idioms of the changing social forms at that time that encouraged this? And we seldom give enough time to analyze those questions. Another obvious question is why did so many Muslims and not inconsequential ones at that, turn their creativity towards Krishna Bhakti. Modern historians have called them Muslim Vaishnavas, but they did not call themselves that. They called themselves Krishna Bhakts. The difference is very significant. In present times, we overlook the fact that non-Muslims in those days only occasionally rather rarely use the label of Muslim that we uniformly use today. In those days, they were more often called Yavanas or Shakas or Turushkas. These labels are ethnic and not religious. They also link up interestingly with earlier history. Yavana was used for the Greeks and for those who came from the West. <coughs> And so it was used for the Arabs. Makes perfect sense. The Shakas were the Scythians from Central Asia. Turushka was amongst the many names for the Kushans, also from Central Asia. These were historically authentic names, therefore, for the Turks, Afghans, and Mughals who came from this same region. However, they are occasionally referred to as Mech, used sometimes in a derogatory sense or as just a passing reference to difference. For example, in one inscription, the Delhi Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq, after a successful Deccan campaign, is described by the local defeated side as a dreadful man who killed Brahmins, destroyed temples, looted farmers, confiscated the land granted to the Brahmins, drank wine and ate beef. But there is also a Sanskrit inscription from Delhi of the same period, issued by a merchant who is full of praise for the Tughlaq rulers, describing them as the historical successors to the Tomar and Chauhan Rajputs, with a bouncing reference to one of them as a village. Obviously, in this case, the meaning is of someone who is different, because no one would dare to refer to the Sultan in a derivative term. Yamanas, Shakas, and Torushkas, who were previously Muslims, were included in the ranks of the other in some texts and by some authors conforming to earlier historical precedents. What complicates this particular otherness is not only its own origins, which are anyway other, but also that it has many selves. For instance, was every Muslim viewed as a lich by upper caste Hindus? Yet there were marriage alliances amongst the highest royalty. The Kashwaha Bharajputs marrying into the Mughal royal family being the most prominent. Upper caste Hindus, Rajputs, Skais, Brahmins, and the Jains held high offices in the administration of the Sultanates and the Mughals. The social distance would presumably have also depended on caste. It is likely that those lower down the social scale would have mixed more easily on all sides. But the distancing of the Avarnas by upper caste Muslims did not change, even when they converted to Islam. The Krishna Huts that I have been speaking of were viewed as the other by two categories of selves. They were strongly disapproved, naturally, 
by the Qazis and the Mullahs of Orthodox Islam, and equally so by Orthodox Brahmins. This was so until such time as it became helpful to the former religions to incorporate some of their teachings. This means that both the other and the self have to be very carefully defined each time either is referred to. This might be an interesting exercise in clarifying identities, especially when they overlap. An interesting comment on this situation comes from a 16th century Sanskrit text, the Prasthanabhe of Madhusudhan Saraswati. He states that the teachings of the Tarushkas, meaning what we would today call Muslims, have to be aligned with those of the Charvak, the Jain, and the Buddhists. And why? Because they were all Gnostic, non-believers. For the Charvak, the Jain, and the Buddhists, this is a repetition of what was said about them by Brahmins two millennia earlier. To these three he added the fourth, the Tarusha. The three did not believe in any deity and therefore rightly were called Gnostic or non-believers. But the Tarushkas did believe. They believed in Allah. But since he was not of the Vedic or Puranic pantheon, he was not acceptable, so they too were called Gnostic. Interestingly, he then goes on to refer to all four groups together as rich. <clears throat> Let me try and make a few final points out of all that I've been saying. I have taken only three historical examples, each separated by a millennium. These were groups that were initially projected as others. From the simple duality that we began with, we arrived finally at layers of otherness and its multiple manifestations. The changing historical context also required them to change. Some were opposed, some were, sub some were subsumed into the dominant society, and some were accommodated as yet another juxtaposed sect. We need to know what social relationships emerged from their presence. This is something we never touch on. We talk about religious differences, and religious similarities, but we don't talk about social relationships. How were they viewed? And equally, how did they view these social relationships? Can we think of projecting history from the perspective of the others? This would be a necessary perspective, as currently we view our past cultures only through the lens of the established self in each period, or else we inflict our present-day stereotypes of the past without examining their viability. We give weightage to the texts of those in authority, be it royalty or sections of the elite, ignoring other multiple views. And in defining our traditions and our cultural inheritance, this multiplicity has a significant presence, both in what was accommodated and in what was contested with an explanation of why one or the other. Understanding the interface between religion and society requires us to recognize that both the former religions and the more informal evolving sects were being transformed by the interface. New thinking arises either to confirm or to dissent. The one cannot be understood without the other. All former religions and settled societies have others, especially when identities are strongly demarcated. Such demarcations seem to receive more emphasis when religions are used to define political identities and social relations. This we have to be aware of. Religion is only one marker of identity and is conjugated with other markers, occupation, caste regulations, language, and so on. 
This makes it essential to relate each religion to its larger social constituency, together with whatever change it undergoes. Why do some religious sects, as the other, become powerful castes, whereas others lose out? Uh, a clear example is close contemporaries, the Lingayats and the Kavipanthis. Since societies change, so do religions linked to these societies. Religious identities are not formed in isolation. More often than not, some are viewed as heritage and some as a reaction to the other, be it from within society or from outside. The process is a kind of cultural symbiosis that gives an imprint to Indian religious articulation which is different from other historical societies. This we have yet to explore. It is not enough to point out, finally, it is not enough to point out that there has always been an other or others, as there have been many selves. The reason for each has to be analyzed in the context of its mutating identity. The other can be a voice of dissent or animosity, characterizing differences that are altered by historical change. The acknowledgement of dissent is essential because it also reflects our own self-perception. Many juxtaposed or even distant sets represent complex and divergent thoughts that have in the past sculpted both the self and the other. This allowed a free play of belief, emotion, and inquiry such that they invalidate our present-day monolithic binary identities. And it is to this that we owe many moments of spectacular thinking that are evident in the dialogues between the self and the other in the past. Thank you.